hear and see me okay? Good morning. Good morning, yep. Good morning. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so we're about to get started. Just a heads up, um, it doesn't look like the chat here on Teams is working for whatever reason, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna have to go uh, on mic if you um, if I call on you. Okay, so heads up. Um, so thank you guys all for for making it this morning. I know we're a little bit behind, but it's okay. Uh, I have Shivani here. Um, Shivani, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Um, she's gonna sure. help me with the presentation today. Hi guys, my name is Shivani Desai. I am a first year uh, medical student at Western University. I did this program when I was a pre-med. It helped me so much and they asked me about it on my interviews and I'm happy to help you today. Sorry, that was, I, the, the, it started, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, did it cut? Oh no. Um, yeah, so Shivani um, has been super awesome. Um, she actually wrote the case for today. We kind of worked on it a bit um, yesterday as well um, and uh, even put together a lot of really great learning points that we're going to go over today too. So hopefully it will be, uh, hopefully it will be really helpful um, for this case and also for the future cases going forward. Um, all right, so before we get started, uh, there's a there's a few announcements that I wanted to make sure that we review. Um, some of you have been reaching out saying that the quiz uh, you had questions about the quiz and um, you wanted to have the answers and like the explanations. And so I don't have that live as of yet. So um, I will either work on that or we can even have a quiz review like we did last time. So if if we are gonna do that then um, then we can we can definitely set up a time where we can we can do that live review. Um, I think there's a question uh, on YouTube. If we didn't get a chance to complete the chess pain course, can we still complete it by next week and receive credit? Yeah, um, in the email that I sent last night, there I, I mentioned that we've been having a, a few issues with actually um, completing the the actual course itself. And then there's also some issues with sign ins and all that. So. I'm gonna leave it open. Uh, you can you can absolutely continue um, working on it and try to finish it as soon as you can. Um, I'm gonna start working on the GI um, course, so we that way we can start doing GI and um, and chest pain um, at the same time, so cardiac and, and GI, and that way we have a little bit more variety in what it is that um, we're learning. Okay. Uh, and then if you have other questions, you know, you can either raise your hand here on Teams or if you're on YouTube, you can absolutely just put it in the chat and we have uh, people monitoring the chat as well. OK, so I also sent uh, in the email yesterday information about groups that we're going to have. So in order to make this a bit more accessible and have you guys learn from each other a bit more, uh, I'm going to put you guys into groups. I said initially four, but there might be more depending on how many people are participating. Um, and um, we're going to use that as a way, one, for you guys to discuss the case and learn from each other, but also so that we have a little bit of a competition going on. Um, so at the end of this uh, cohort, um, so that'll be in about four or five months, uh, give or take, the group with the top score on Kahoot will uh, win some type of prize. It's not determined yet, but we'll, we'll try to figure out what that is. Um, and the way that it'll work is the top five scores on Kahoot will, will count towards the points for that meeting. So um, the groups aren't set yet. We're, I'll try to um, work on that this, this week and you'll know which group you're in um, by, by the end of, um, by the end of the week. Um, if you have anybody that may be interested in joining, um, you can absolutely invite them yourselves. And uh, if you want them in your group, um, we I can do that. So basically the more people you have in your group, the, the higher likelihood you will have to winning at the end of the, this, um, the session. So uh, it's kind of a win for everybody. Um, the, the other thing is the person with the highest score at the end of um, 
at, at the end of all of this um, in about four or five months um, is going to get another kind of gift prize, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I'm going to get you guys a, uh, a Littman stethoscope. So that's the stethoscope that I use for med school, for residency, and still now in my practice. It's the same stethoscope I've been using for now like seven years um, that I've been uh, since medical school. So uh, since the start of medical school. So um, it's it's really durable. It's a great stethoscope. And so the person who has the highest score at the end is going to get one. Right. Um, any questions about that at all? No, it doesn't look like it. Cool. All right. And then um, let's see here. Um, I'm also going to be restarting my mentoring. So you guys that are in this program is going to have a preference and, and priority to be tutored one on one or, or not tutored, sorry, mentored one on one. So um, I will send you guys the uh, the signups before I send anybody else and before I post it on social media. So um, hopefully that will be helpful. Is there a question? No. OK. And um, and then at the end of all of uh, all of this today, um, I'll stay behind and uh, see if there's any feedback, ideas, you know, Q&A in general. Um, if you do have any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to help out. So the flow today, uh, we're going to go ahead and start with the case. And then after that, uh, we'll we'll go into um, Kahoot. OK. So let me, Shivani, do you want to share the, the PowerPoint or do you want, do you want me to do it? I can share it. Okay, cool. Whenever you're ready. Okay. And, um, and just a heads up, the course is live. So as we go through the case, go ahead and, um, and go through the course as well. Um, I am going to actually, Shivani, real quick before we do that, I'm going to switch over to my screen um, just so I can show you where it's at. So if you were to go to the scholarly site, it's going to be um, it's going to be over here in the courses. And you guys can see it, see my screen. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, and it'll be right here, the virtual medical rounds 123-22. It should say free, enroll, and this it's basically just uh, any course materials that we're going to post afterwards and then the quiz there itself, okay? Uh, so fill that out as we go along. Um, and it's all, um, it's all yours, Shivani. Okay, thank you. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, we can. OK, perfect. Should be going into presenter mode. There we go. So we're going to be talking about a cardiovascular soap note today. And um, these are the learning objectives. We're going to be reviewing basic card anatomy and um, practice sorting out information, see what parts of or not, or determine if the patient is sick or not sick after getting their history. And then we'll be looking at chest x-rays and learning the fundamentals of reading an EKG. So some of these things I'm also learning in class right now. So um, it's helpful for medical students and pre-meds alike, and we'll all have to know this information. So um, first, before we start, um, I was just... Uh, Wondering if you guys could name any of the anatomy of the heart. I can't really see um, people in the chat. So Dr. Nakvi, if you want to help me with the questions. Yeah, um, so uh, let's let's go with um, let's go with Caitlin. Do you can you name any of the anatomy here in the heart? Or like what what um, is pretty obvious? Um, anatomically and what's there. Okay, let's go with, uh, all right, Prem, go for it. Uh, we could say the ventricles and the um, atria, 
So the right and left ventricles, right and left atria. Okay. Uh, yeah. With the valves like the aorta and the vena cava. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So Shivani, do you want to kind of point all of that out um, where the where those structures are? Yeah. So the largest heart, the largest muscle in the heart would be the left ventricle, which you see over here. The heart sits um, slightly rotated on its axis when it's in our body. So the left ventricle is sitting out and you have the right ventricle right here. Right above it would be the right atrium and the structure sitting on top of the right atrium is called the right auricle. And the left ventricle would be posteriorly. And this would be the aorta. This would be the aortic arch where we have the brachiocephalic trunks coming off. And then we have the vena cava here and the other pulmonary arteries um, would be seen better from the back. And then you have the right and left coronary arteries which supply the heart itself as well from the epicardium of the heart. And the epicardium is the outermost layer of the heart. So sometimes it can also get um, infected as well. And yeah, do you have any other questions or anything you'd like to add? No, that was that was really great. I think it's it's really important to know the general anatomy of the heart because when we talk about different diseases of the heart, um, it's going to be important to know what what part of the heart is actually affected because in in the end the heart is just a pump and for the pump to work efficiently you need to be able to adequately um, have you have to have each of the sections of the heart working in sync and so when one part fails the entire pump starts to fail right so knowing this general anatomy uh, and we'll, you'll see with uh, with uh, reading ekgs uh, knowing this general anatomy is super super important uh, that's all i gotta add Cool. All right, I'm just trying to advance slides. There we go. So now we are going to talk about the electrical activity of the heart and how the blood pump actually starts. This is important to know as it is why things go wrong. So originally, this is also on the MCAT, um, and originally the electrical activity starts at the SA node, and then it moves down, depolarizes the atria. So it basically makes the atria contract, and then it goes to the AV node. The AV node is located right here. In the AV node, there's a slight pause to allow the the ventricles to fill from the atria and then the electrical activity quickly moves down um, this region right here if you can see my arrow which is called the um, bundle of his and then the electrical activity moves across the Purkinje fibers on the right and left side of the heart um, that will help the ventricles squeeze so that's the basic anatomy and the way to remember it for your MCAT is start a blood pump. So SA node, AV node, bundle of his, and then Purkinje fibers. Yeah. Cool. So now we're going to move on to the subjective section, which is the first section. And um, so we have a patient who is Jessica Day. She's 65 year old female presenting with intense sharp chest, eight out of 10 chest pain that occurred yesterday when waking up. She admits to persistent cough over the last two weeks and the pain remained intense for a period of two minutes and reduces to a dull radiating pain of three out of 10 severity around her left arm and shoulder that eventually improved over the course of 30 minutes. However, this morning she presented with a sharp six out of 10 pain on the left side of her chest that began as she was stretching for her morning walk. The pain has not improved with walking and has not changed since onset two hours ago. So now we have some questions and I'd encourage all of you to participate as it would really help. And even if you don't know the answer, it's all good. And Dr. Nafi will lead the questions. Yeah, so um, one, like, let, let's just try to identify identify the, the chief complaint. So, uh, Sarah, do you think that you can um, identify the main chief complaint um, in this in this section? Uh, yeah, so it seems like um, mostly it's chest pain. Um, so and it's occurring um, multiple times. Yeah. So uh, when you write out when you write out the chief complaint, it's it's exactly that. Just what that person is coming in for, right? So in this case, it's going to be just chest pain. Um, 
And then that that first statement of, of your chief complaint is super important because it helps dictate where you're going to be starting with the history and physical. Sometimes the patient will come and say that it is um, abdominal pain, right? But as you get a little bit more information, you start realizing it's less ab abdominal pain. It's more uh, something like chest pain, right? So um, exactly. And then um, Andrew, um, what what are some of the different processes that can be going on with the chest if you're having radiating chest pain? So let's say that the chest pain is radiating to um, the throat. What would you potentially be thinking about? Um, uh, let's see. I'm not too sure. Um, the only thing I could think of is it's just innervating some nerves. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so a lot of referred pain, like pain that comes from, let's say pain that comes from the heart, right? The heart has um, sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, uh, fibers that go to the heart. And so you have a, a bunch of different neural pathways that, that eventually intersect as it relays back to your brain. So if you're having pain fibers from the heart coming back up and, and traveling through those similar um, uh, neural networks, you you may have referred pain uh, so exactly so if it is referral to the neck it's possibly because of that what is something that can happen in the chest that um, another structure that's in the chest that's not the heart that can that can uh that you can feel pain in and i'll, and I'll keep it with you andrew um let's see can you feel it in the lungs you can feel it in the lungs yeah Usually, when it, if we're talking about the, the esophagus, so it usually wouldn't radiate to the esophagus. So, what's right underneath the heart? Um, is it, I, I don't diaphragm know. or it, your? It, yeah, the diaphragm is underneath, and then right behind the heart. Sorry, um, what's what's there? Um, Leads to like, your stomach. Uh, esophagus. Exactly. So if if you have um, if you have something like reflux, right? If you have um, acid refluxing from the stomach up into the esophagus, you might have this chest pain that radiates upwards to the neck. Now, would you would you be comfortable if you have the sixty five year old patient to say that uh, that this is um, um, like GERD and reflux? Um, because it's radiating, let's say it radiated to the neck. Would you would you be comfortable with that? Um, I'm not sure because it's kind of starting from the heart. Um, yeah, well, actually, we don't know, right? We don't okay. know where it's starting because the patient isn't coming in saying that this is, uh, I'm having heart pain, right? They're saying they have mm -hmm. chest pain. Right. Pain, somewhere yeah. in this area they're having pain right so um that's what that's what your job is your job is to kind of figure out exactly what's triggering this pain so you got to think about all the different structures in the chest that that can um that can contribute so just like you said the lungs is one the heart is another the diaphragm is another the esophagus itself is another as well right so um, perfect. So at this point, we know that she's having chest pain. Um, and in terms of um, radiation, it's going to the, the arm and shoulder. And um, uh, Danya, um, when you have radiating pain to the, the shoulder, what do you usually think about? Um, heart attack, MI. A heart attack or an MI? Perfect. What about if it's specifically to the right shoulder and not necessarily to the left shoulder? Is there anything else that can cause pain going to the shoulder? Um, yes, musculoskeletal, like something in the chest wall, perhaps. In the chest wall, but there um, had, uh, do you know which nerves, um, which nerves control the movement of the diaphragm? And you, it's okay if you don't. Yes, phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve. Okay, perfect. So the phrenic nerve actually um, uh, it is innervated, or it, it the roots are from C three, four, and five up here in the neck. 
So those fibers go down into uh, down through the diaphragm to actually help the diaphragm move up and down. But with those fibers also uh, innervate the arm, right? So if you have any type of diaphragm irritation, sometimes you feel it in the shoulder and the arm instead of just the, the diaphragm itself. And so we see this a lot in, in patients that um, had a recent surgery and they, they have to, um, they, they, they had to kind of inflate the stomach with gas so that they can actually do the surgery laparoscopically. And so if that, the, the gas that's kind of left in the abdomen eventually gets uh, absorbed up by your body, but it irritates the diaphragm. And so patients will often complain of that shoulder pain um, when they, uh, after a surgery. So perfect. Um, and then what about, what about a pain that comes and goes? Joey, what, what do you, what do you think about a pain that comes and goes? Uh, she could be aggravating it somehow. Like, um, I guess in this case, she got it while she was walking the second time. So maybe an increase of heart rate. Yeah. So, so, um, Absolutely. If, if she's aggravating it somehow, if something's provoking it, that's going to be important. But if you're, if you're thinking about pain that comes and goes versus pain that is constant, right? Which one do you think is going to be more worrisome? Joey? Um, probably constant pain. Yeah, right? Because pain that comes and goes, um, a lot of times... You know, it's it's very possible that that it can be something dangerous, um, um, and we see that in kids sometimes with something like intussusception, and we'll talk about that in in the GI system where uh, part of the bowel kind of telescopes into the other part, and it some it can cut off uh, blood supply. And then same thing you can have with like ovarian torsion, where the ovary twists on itself, the blood supply uh, decreases, you have severe abdominal pain and then it, it untwists. And, and, um, and so, yeah, so that, that is a possibility where it can still be, be dangerous, even if it's intermittent. But uh, for the most part, the more dangerous forms of uh, pain are going to be more constant, right? So the reason why I, I bring that up is to that, that first question, is the patient sick or not sick? Um, and having more consistent and constant pain, while not a hundred percent, while not being a hundred percent certain that this constitutes like a sick patient, it, it does still raise a, a few red flags. Uh, does that make sense? Sounds like it makes sense. All right, Shivani, you can you can continue. Okay, so the same patient had no trouble performing daily activities yesterday, but is feeling increasing pain, which is not subsiding today, and it is of 6 out of 10 severity. She experiences palpitations often, but is not concerned by them, and she complains of tenderness on the chest. So. All right, so uh, now we're, we're kind of seeing that the pain is more constant, right? So what what processes are you thinking about? And we'll go to Carlos. What processes are you thinking about if the, since the pain is constant? All right. Um, what about Alyssa? What, what processes are you thinking about since the pain is more constant? Um, I don't know. I was just thinking about it. Um, I don't know, I'd be still probably worried about a heart attack, I feel like. Okay, absolutely. You, you want to think about a heart attack. Um, so we're, we're kind of going back to that same question of sick or not sick. So um, if it's a more constant pain, we're more inclined to say, okay, there may be something more dangerous going on. And so you want to start thinking about some of those more dangerous diagnoses, just like a heart attack. What are some other diagnoses that may that may also be um, uh, more dangerous in this case. Still me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, well, I was thinking because of the like, radiating pain pericarditis, 
as well. Okay. Yeah, pericarditis, definitely. Um, and what about what about instead of the heart? What about lung pathology? What is, what is some lung issue that can be going on that can be dangerous in this case? Well, definitely an embolism is dangerous. Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, now, what? And we kind of we kind of talked about this already. Uh, so, Anusha, um, what organ systems are more likely the cause of this patient's pain, and and what organ systems are a little less likely? Um. So I would say like respiratory, cardio, maybe even GI would probably be more likely. Okay. Um, and then like least likely would probably be mm, maybe like neuro would probably be like more like least likely. Yeah, neuro, um, musculoskeletal, you know, it's, it's a little less likely, although possible because she still has the chest tenderness. Um, but what, what I want you guys to start thinking about is it's very easy to kind of get the, the information, the, the subjective part of um, the case and just immediately go to this is probably uh, this is probably like a PE or a heart attack or a pericarditis. Right. But instead of doing that, uh, yes, have those in the back of your mind, but take a step back and think about what organ systems are more likely. Right. And so that, that, that will help you start thinking about this a bit more systematically. Right. So if she's having uh, chest pain, there's some radiation, there's a little bit of tenderness. OK, what are some of the possible um, what are some of the possible organ systems involved? And just like you said, heart, lungs, musculoskeletal, less likely neuro, possibly GI. And that'll help you start organizing your information a little bit more because it's that organization ultimately that will help you uh, manage uh, the cases a bit better. Uh, perfect. So Shivani, take it away. Perfect. So um, we're now going to look at her uh, general exam and she has no fever, no weight loss and no chills for cardiovascular. Um, she's noticed some swelling in the feet every night and um, when waking up, which goes away while performing daily activities. And so now what can you say about the swelling? So uh, let's see, Imad, what, what thoughts do you have about the swelling? And is it relevant to her pain? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. Because it's causing pressure to her heart. But her her swelling, where is it at? Feet. Her feet, right? So it, would the swelling be causing pressure on her heart? Probably not, I guess. And, and it's okay if you don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Okay, okay. So um, it, this is like this is like one of those things where we uh, we included this because one, you're gonna see it in patients, right? You're gonna see patients with just leg swelling, and you have to decide. And, and a bunch of actually different um, different complaints, different parts of the history, different physical exam findings. And you got to decide, you know, is this actually relevant or not, right? Because if this isn't relevant and you start going towards the swelling, well, then you're kind of wasting your time and this patient might die from something else, right? So um, is there something in the, uh, is there some form of, or some pathology that causes chest pain that you can see leg swelling with? Uh, not that I know. OK. Um, all right, I think somebody raised their hand. I missed who it was. Yeah. Uh, go go for it. Uh, the tool. I was going to say maybe heart failure, but she doesn't have any dizziness or shortness of breath, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so heart failure, absolutely. Um, it, it can. Um, but what about what about leg swelling, right? So if you have mm -hmm. one-sided leg swelling and chest pain, 
what is something that you think about when when somebody comes comes in with that? Yeah, so uh, uh, people on YouTube are saying DVT pulmonary embolism. Absolutely. Um, so a pulmonary em embolism, you can a lot of times have one sided leg swelling. And if that clot um, goes from the leg to the lungs, that's going to cause um, that's going to cause chest pain, too. So usually, though, a pulmonary embolism is only one sided. It's 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 very rare for you to have a, a bilateral. So both sides um, of leg of leg swelling and, and a bilateral uh, DVT, um, perfect. So um, and then I think uh, Abatul said possibly this being um, this being something like heart failure, which we would absolutely want to know if she has a history of heart failure. Um, so yes, and then so in terms of the relevance to her pain, it, it's unsure. Okay. Uh, Benia, did you want to add something? Oh, uh, I was I was just going to mention that she was it said that she was 65 years old. So mm -hmm. maybe it could be like a clot since she's she may not be contracting her muscles enough to get the blood pumping. And so yeah, it, it's, oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 go for it. And it also said that she admits to cough and shortness of breath, which could also contribute to their like not being enough blood that's getting pumped to the lungs so it's like not as profuse so they have like they need to like make up for it with that shortness of breath so i thought it might be risk of a pulmonary embolism yeah no absolutely you have all of those symptoms and in people also um get caught with the pulmonary embolism too um so absolutely right caitlin did you want to add something yeah I was just thinking about um, what we were saying earlier with how like the heart could be a, a main cause or like belongs to be a main cause. And since she's admitting a cough and shortness of breath and she has like fluid retention in her legs, I was thinking it could possibly be COPD with the, her other symptoms and her age as well. Yeah, so COPD for sure for the cough, you don't usually see edema with COPD. Um, unless the COPD is also causing heart failure, right? Okay. Um, and so the way that that works is the there's more resistance in the lung. And so the right side of the heart can't push as much blood to the lungs. And when that when that happens, it starts to build up. And so if you think about blood flow to the heart, it's all through veins and veins don't really have a good pumping system. So you can't really go against that pressure. Um, um, and so you have the right ventricle helping to push the fluid forward. But if you have a lot of resistance in the lungs itself because of a COPD um, and because all the arteries in the in the actual lung are kind of clamped down, then you will have buildup of fluid in the legs. Um, so the COPD itself is not causing the, the lower extremity edema, the lower extremity swelling. It's more the, um, the resistance that's formed and the inability of the heart to, to effectively push past that. And that's why, uh, and that's actually a really great point um, to highlight the importance of the, uh, how, how crucial the, the efficiency of the heart pump is because once one part starts to fail, the whole system starts to fail. Uh, okay, and then um, Shivani, I don't, did you talk about the chest pain tachycardia part? So she experiences chest pain and tachycardia is uh, measured using a home pulse oximeter and the patient experienced uh, numbness and tingling in the left arm in the mornings as well. Awesome, so uh, I, I'm sorry, I did not. Huh? Does it change your differential? That's the question. Or? Yeah, yeah. So I am. I'm sorry, I don't know how to um, pronounce the name. Uh, Sean Muganathan. Okay, theory. Right. And then, please, uh, uh, if you do answer. How, how would I and just make sure I pronounce the name right? OK, that's OK. Uh, let's see, Anne? 
does the does the information above change or differential make anything more uh, more likely versus less likely? Okay. What about Sarah? Um, I was gonna say that I I think especially with the tingling in the left arm, it kind of um, for me at least I thought it confirmed more that it was related to a heart attack. Possibly, possibly. Um, you usually get more pain than than numbness and tingling, but that but that's kind of thinking about more common symptoms, right? But yeah, you can have some numbness and tingling. Um, for sure. Anything else uh, that I guess um, not so much the numbness and tingling. What about the tachycardia, um, the cough? Does that make anything more likely? And we'll stick with you, Sarah. Um. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, that's okay. Shauna? I think it could point to some sort of like lung um, lung differential because if um, if there's like a cough or shortness of breath, it could be that like, I think someone mentioned the lung isn't perfusing correctly or there could be some difficult with like the lung fully inflating for intake of breath and that's causing that um, cough and shortness of breath. And I think referred pain could also be the reason for that numbness and tingling. Um, yeah, that, that, those are my thoughts right now. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, the, the big question is, okay, does this change the differential at all? And to be honest with you, it doesn't. I think we still would have to, um, keep it pretty broad in terms of the differential. So, um, I think you guys are right on, right on the spot. So Shivani, uh, go for it. Cool. All right, so we're now on her medications and her allergies. So for her medication, she's taking metoprolol, metoprolol, metformin, and she did not take her medication this morning as she came into the hospital. Uh, she has no known allergies to drugs or contact, but has environmental allergies to pollen, and she gets a runny nose upon exposure, and she's allergic to peanuts, which results in hives all over her body. For her past medical history, she was diagnosed with HTN at um, age 35, diagnosed with diabetes at age 46, and has a history of cervical stenosis. Um, I can't hear you. Oh, in, in terms of, sorry, in terms of pertinent past medical history, um, the, the, and I'll kind of take this one in, in the interest of time. Um, so the medications are always helpful, right? You want to know what the patient is taking and also is the patient compliant with her medication? So it, it seems like she didn't take it this morning, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't take it regularly. That's another question that we would want to ask. Uh, and uh, allergies, if you think that this is potentially a, an allergic reaction, you would want to know that as well. Um, her past medical history is going to be super, super important, right? So what is it that is potentially contributing to her underlying issue? So the hypertension, the diabetes, both are going to be really, really important uh, because that increases her risk for things like an MI, like a stroke, especially if it's not controlled, right? And then the cervical stenosis um, is is important in a way to kind of rule out some of this um, arm tingling that she's been having. It doesn't rule it out completely. That's not to say that it's not possible for her to have a radiating pain to the arm if it's her heart. Or, um, but, you know, if she's had one question that you might want to ask is if she's had this pain prior, the numbness and tingling, has she had that prior to the, this onset? And if she did, then, OK, maybe this is less likely relevant. Uh, OK, perfect. Cool. So uh, now we're going to ask you what additional history do you think is important and what else should we have looked at? So Shadi, what do you think is going to be a bit more important to ask for the history? All right, Nima, what do you think is going to be more important for the history? 
um, her salt intake and if she, how much alcohol she drinks. Oh, look at that, her diet. Yeah, salt intake, alcohol, what else? Something else that can contribute to, uh, to like heart pathology. Nima, what do you think? Um, heart pathology. <sighs> Yeah, so you said so you said um, you said alcohol, so right. kind of the same thing. Um, so if she has any history of substance abuse, like or or just in general smoking, right? Yeah. Um, so smoking history, family history, like people on YouTube are saying, family history, prior surgeries, uh, exercise history is all going to be super important. Um, surgeries, I would say maybe not as much, unless you're starting to think that it may be, she had a recent surgery and this is a complication. Sarah, did you have anything else to add? I was just going to say the smoking. Okay, cool, cool. So Shivani, what do we have next? We have her history next. Um, she had a past surgical history for all four wisdom teeth removal at age 22. No complications and was placed under anesthesia. She had a C-section for all three of her children, um, 22, 24, and 26, respectively. There were no complications for that as well. Now we have her family history for her mother, who was age 34, diagnosed with hypothyroidism at age 55. Her father was deceased at 50 in a vehicle collision and was otherwise healthy. And she has one younger sister who was 54 and healthy. So for now, social history, what we just talked about, um, where we looked at uh, the tobacco and she smokes one pack of cigarettes a week but does not drink any alcohol. Um, she doesn't use any other illegal or recreational drugs except for one cup of coffee every morning. Her diet consists of homemade food such as vegetables and bean curries and naans, and she tries to exercise once a week by going on walks with her daughter. Um, works at her office as a sales representative manager and experiences high stress levels. What are the long-term effects of stress on the heart? Sarah, I don't I, I know your hand is probably up, not up for this question, but since your hand is up, I'm going to ask you <laughs> this question. So what are some of the long-term effects that you can think can happen to the heart because of stress? Um, you can have, uh, I guess build up of like higher heart rate, which can lead to, you know, heart issues later on. Um, trying to think, higher blood pressure. Um, trying to think of what else. Those are the two that I can think of right now. Yeah. So, so that's actually you're you're kind of talking talking the symptoms, uh, but uh, in general. Um, what what we what you're kind of getting at is if you have chronic stress, that's that's a chronic fight or flight response that you're in um, for a long period of time, right? So your body is getting pumped with adrenaline, uh, getting you ready to you know to fight off whatever it is that you're you're um, going against, and that over the long uh, the long term can cause. Uh, cause elevated blood pressure, your heart has to work faster and harder, um, and it can cause a lot of strain to the heart. Um, and, you know, um, with all that strain, absolutely, um, you can be at higher risk for something like a heart attack too. So, yeah, I think some people on on, um, on YouTube are saying constant release of stress hormones might cause infl inflammation in the body. Uh, high cholesterol levels can surpass the, uh, suppress the cardiac cardiac system, uh, irregular heart rate and rhythm. Um, yeah, so something like uh, an atrial fibrillation can can come about um, as well. So, so absolutely. Take it away, Shivani. Cool. So um, now we're going to ask, uh, is the patient sick or not sick? Ashleen, what do you think? Is the patient sick or is the patient not sick? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that um, some of the symptoms did seem a little bit abnormal, like the tingling in the arm, 
um, the shortness of breath. But again, they did say that she smoked a lot. So mm-hmm. I guess um, I would say it does have something to do with that. So maybe she is sick. Yeah. So, so yeah. So basically what, what your impression is, does this patient need to be in the ER? Is she, does she need to, um, is she able to be discharged? Like, so sick versus not sick is going to help you triage that. Nima, thoughts? Um, I would order an EKG first and also do a CBC on her as well. Yeah, you're, you're gonna def- yeah, you're going to definitely want to get those labs. Um, the, the downside of it, though, right, is you, you order those labs, but it's going to take a while, right? It's going to take a bit. And so you have to be able to develop that, that, that intuition, almost that, that experience to say, okay, this patient is coming in. This is what they look like. I am very concerned that this patient might have something dangerous going on, or uh, this patient doesn't look that, that sick. I'm not as concerned at this point. So, um, so yeah, um, but yeah, absolutely. You want to be able to get those labs so we can go for it, Shivani. So these are her vitals. Her blood pressure was 140 over 90 and her heart rate was 110. Her respiratory rate was 24 and her BMI was 28.3. Her weight was 160 pounds. Her height was 5'3 and her temperature was 98.4 and her O2 stats were 98%. What do you guys think about this? Yeah, so let's let's go with Sophia. What What is your interpretation of the vitals? or anybody else? Andrew, what are your, what's your interpretation of the vitals? Okay, uh, Alyssa? Yeah, it looks like she has high blood pressure and heart rate and respiratory rate. Yeah, so heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, they're all high. Um, what What is your interpretation of that? What can possibly be going on with those vitals? So definitely, sorry. Um, she definitely, I feel like her heart, maybe overworking itself um due to that blood pressure and heart rate and it could be something as well like with the lungs with the respiratory rate being high as well yeah so we're kind of going back to what is the what's which um which organ systems are involved um benia um i agree with Alyssa that it might be um associated with the heart but if we look at the O2 stat, it it's fairly normal. So it might be leading or like the pretest probability for it being like a cardiac cause as opposed to a pulmonary cause is more likely. Yeah. Um, and so so the question is, you know, with that O2 stat, is she having a true distress versus not, right? Um, a respiratory distress and you know her elevated heart rate her elevated respiratory rate might be more from um, agitation of what else is going on it may not actually be her lungs um, but absolutely you do want to still think about the lungs especially because she's tachycardic right tachycardic patient with chest pain you want to make sure that it's not a pulmonary embolism all right we can go forward Shivani. So we're moving on to the physical exam now. She's alert and oriented times four, and she appears distressed. Uh, she, her chest wall is without deformities. There is no pectus excavatum or carinatum, and rib cage contour is normal. There is no redness or erythema or bruising on her posterior or anterior skin, and uh, dorsalis pedis and radial pulses are two out of three bilaterally, and the carotid pulse is two out of three bilaterally as well. There's normal S1 and S2 sounds heard. She has tachycardic but normal rhythm. 
And for her respiratory system, it's clear to auscultation bilaterally. There's no weasels, wheezes, crackles, or ronchi, and she appears to have increased work of breathing. So, um, you know, just to go through that physical exam, the uh, a, lo a lot of information there, really just to say that the the exam is overall normal, right? So no deformities on chest wall, pectus excavatum and carinatum is kind of an indenting or an out flare of the chest, um, the rib cage, um, and that may potentially put you more prone to certain diseases. Um, um, the, the pulses all look really great. The skin looks great. The carotid pulse looks good too. The only thing that's really abnormal there is the tachycardia and the increased work of breathing. Uh, so it can go forward. So uh, now her capillary refill is less than two seconds on fingers and toes bilaterally, and she has a one plus edema bilaterally in lower extremities um, to the mid leg. So what do, what would capillary refill let you see? Caitlin, what do you think? Um. Would it have to do with anything of like her being a little dehydrated? Yeah. Uh, so so cap refill. Um, basically, the the idea and what you do is usually on the toes or the finger. You pinch it to put, push all that blood out, um, and then you see how quickly the blood reflows uh, or refills into that into that finger. So it'll look white, and you should try it on yourselves too. It'll look white. Um, when you push, and then as you let go, you'll see pink or, or redness come back to the finger. So if this is less, if this is less than two seconds, that's kind of what we want, right? We want that blood to be pushed out and then quickly come back in. But if it's longer than two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, it's really delayed. You want to consider: is there something going on with the actual blood flow to um, to the extremity, right? So if you think of something like an aortic dissection, where that that blood flow is interrupted you might have um, um, an abnormal cap refill. Um, or if you think about um, somebody with severe stenosis of the arteries in like, let's say the lower extremities, you may be, you may see that as well. Um, absolutely. All right. We can go forward. Yeah. So just questions again, is the patient sick or not sick? Uh, Imad, what do you think? I think most of the results show that uh, most of the things look normal from what okay. I can see. So do you think the patient is sick or not sick? I'm going to go as uh, not sick. OK, what about the vitals, though? The, the patient was tachycardic, blood pressure was up, the heart, the, the respiratory rate was up. Would that uh, change? Could that, could that do more with her stress levels? Possibly, yeah, very possibly. She, she might be having an anxiety attack, right? But she's, mm -hmm. but if we think about the, the case as a whole, right? She's coming in with chest pain that, that worsened after she started exercising um, or after she started doing some activity in the morning. She was having uh, some shortness of breath, cough. She, um, the chest pain hasn't gotten any better at all. She has risk factors, right? She has hypertension and, uh, and uh, diabetes, um, and she smokes, right? So all of that puts her at high risk for something um, bad going on with the heart, with the lungs. Um, so I would probably say that this patient is sick, uh, and we need to get more um, testing. Um, but, you know, it, it, it all depends, right? If the patient had all of this, and she was sitting comfortably in front of you, I wouldn't brush it off as nothing and send her home. I'd still want to do the workup, but then I'd be a little bit less inclined to say that she uh, that uh, she needs like an expedited workup right this second, right? So yeah, I would I would say she, I, but I would say she's sick. Uh, all right, next slide, Shivani. So labs, what do you think is going to be important, Prem? What would you want to get? Uh, I'm thinking like CBC first off. What are you looking for in the CBC? Um, honestly, like white blood cell counts, and then 
Honestly, I think that's it. Like, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. Yeah, so the white blood cell count is going to be important if you're thinking some type of inflammatory process going on. Absolutely. What other labs um, would you want to get? What other labs did you want to get? For Dania? Uh, cardiac monitors, uh, like uh, put them on a cardiac monitor, first of all, then um, <clears throat> troponin and other cardiac markers. Yeah, um, absolutely. Is there is there another lab that you would want to get? And I think somebody, meant, and Nassim mentioned it on YouTube. Uh, but there's one other lab that's actually going to be really important for this patient. Is it a D-dimer? Um, so a D-dimer might be helpful if you're if you're worried about uh, pulmonary embolism. The problem is a D-dimer is actually not a very good test if there's any type of inflammation or process going on in the body, right? Um, because it's an inflammatory marker as well. If you have some abnormal process, inflammation, infection, that deep dimer is going to be elevated and it's not going to be as helpful. Um, versus if it's negative, that helps us rule out a clot. Um, so in this case, this specific case, I probably wouldn't order a deep dimer just because it wouldn't um, it, it wouldn't help us as much. And if you were really that concerned about a pulmonary embolism or a, a DVT, you would just order the ultrasound. Uh, Benny, what do you what what other things would you think about? Um, we can order a troponin test to look at the degree of like cardiac muscle like failure or like cell death. Yeah, so that's going to be probably one of the more important tests, right? Mm -hmm. If we're thinking that this is potentially a um, a cardiac issue, you're going to want to make sure that uh, you, you're going to want to make sure that you check that troponin. Good. So we can go forward. Now we move on to her x-ray, and this is what we see here. And Yeah, so um, I will, I'll go ahead and interpret the, the chest x-ray just in the interest of time. Um, so just like we've talked about before, you want to have a system for, um, for reading a chest x-ray. So the airways, um, oh, I actually, you can't see my cursor. You know what, Shivani, I'm going to, um, I am going to steal the presentation from you. Uh, so that way we can um, I can finish up that that part, okay? Mm -hmm. um, let me see here. Stop presenting. Okay. So let's. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yeah, yeah, see it. So you can see what I'm pointing to right here? Mm-hmm, yes. All right. So this is the airways, right? The airways nice and center. Um, the clavicles are symmetrical, so it tells us that the patient's not um, rotated or anything like that, but the airways are super important. You, there's no deviation left or right, less likely in something like a pneumothorax, right? Um, so that's your A. Uh, B is your bones. So we talked about the clavicles. We look at all the different ribs, make sure that they are, you know, they're, um, they, they're traveling well. They're not, uh, there's no breaks in the ribs on both sides. You count how many ribs are there. If there is at least seven or eight, that's actually a good inspiration. You want the patient to be breathing in so you can see more love, right? Um, uh, so that's your B. C is your uh, cardiac silhouette. So you look at the outline of the heart. It needs to be nice and sharp. There shouldn't be any blunting, no like haziness down here at the borders. And this all looks really great. The other thing that you want to make sure is it's not like a circle, like this big circle that you can think of something like a cardiac tamponade, um, where that, that pericardial sac just fills with fluid, right? Um, D is your diaphragm. So look at the, the shape of the diaphragm. It should be this sharp kind of almost V-like shape that, that humps over here. Um, and we see that here, there's no fluid down here um, that would make us think of like a, a uh, an infection or uh, congestive heart failure. And the same thing with this side as well, um, A, B, C, D, and then E is everything else. So that's your actual lung parenchyma, the actual lung tissue itself. Uh, 
if you're thinking about something like heart failure, one thing that you can do is you, there's like, you can see here, there's a bunch of stuff happening right here in the middle. And that's very normal, right? All of your vessels, all of the airways come out from um, this area and that's called your hilum. And we'll, um, and we can talk about that a bit more in the future in terms of just uh, lung anatomy. Um, but if you think about how gravity pulls everything down, the bottom, the, the vessels at the bottom of the heart should usually be more plump than the ones on the, on the top, right? So if you look at these um, vessels right here, these are bigger, like fatter vessels coming out, um, especially like this one right there, versus the ones coming out here are a bit more spidery, they're thinner. You can probably see it a bit better on this side. Um, these coming out here are thinner than the ones coming out down here. So that tells us that she's probably not having something like a CHF exacerbation, right? Because um, sometimes it's not so much filling up the lungs as of yet, but you can see a lot of congestion and pressure in the vessels because of it. And in, in the future, we'll kind of go through this a bit more, but I would encourage you to look at um, chest x-rays for CHF so that way you can kind of see that difference, okay? Um, so this is a very normal chest x-ray to me. Um, what about this EKG? And I will give it to, let me see here. Uh, let's go with Danya. What do you think about that EKG? Yes, I'm zooming into it right now. I'm trying to see. Um, so definitely the first thing is tachycardic. Mm. It is relatively high, but it's regular. So it doesn't seem like she's an AFib. Good. Um, is she tachycardic? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't count. Not one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, I mean, well, her heart rate was, but her EKG is not showing that, I guess. Yeah, so so that might that's probably just not concordance with the the actual case itself. But um, the the way, how do you how are you checking um, how are you checking for tachycardia? Uh, lead to usually. Um, so I would just, honestly, the, the, easiest, the, e the easiest way for me to do it is just to look at the actual leads here, uh, of the, the rhythm strip down here and just count. Um, there's a bunch of different ways, but the easiest way for you guys right now is to count the peaks. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And that's a 10, a 10 second strip. So you have 16 heartbeats in 10 seconds. So that's going to be 16 times 6. That is what? Uh, can't do math. 92, right? 16 times 6. Yes, 92. Do I have an agreement? 96. I think it's 96. 96. Yeah, 96. Awesome. Uh, nice skill. <laughs> close, but no cigar. So yeah, 96. So close to tachycardia, not quite there, right? Um, what else, Tonya? What else are you seeing? Um, well, she has the full uh, QRS interval. Her SD segment is not elevated. Seems... Normal. What about what about That's right really here? That's really it. What do you see right here? Can you see my cursor? I'm sorry, right where? No, I don't see it. Ah, oh, dang it. Um, oh, right there. I see it now. Go ahead. Okay. What um, What do you see right there? Oh yes. Um. Right where? Can you point like circle that area? Like right. in this whole rhythm area? Okay. Yeah. Um, what is that right there? Oh gosh. I don't know. Um I so, can't really tell. Is that is that a T wave like right after the S? Like No, that's that the T wave is gonna be kind of like right down here. Um, but that's perfect. So we can we can go into kind of just some basics of an EKG so we can talk about it a little bit more. So the, the EKG itself is just a measurement of how the electrical activity in the heart is working, right? Um, your, your heart cells are basically muscle cells, right? The majority of them are muscle cells. Muscle cells have a bunch of different um, 
ion channels in them. And as the ion channels open and close, you have positive, um, positive ions going from outside the, the cell membrane to inside or vice versa, right? So that change in polarity of the cell membrane causes depolarization of the cell in general, and you have the signal propagating down um, uh, propagating down the uh, the cells and along that pathway. So the there's a few different types of cells in the heart. So there's the electrical conducting cells, the myocytes that contract, and the pacemaker cells um, that actually set the pace of the node. Um, and so if we look here, um, the SA node is right up here up top, right? This um, helps trigger the actual heartbeat itself, and this usually dictates the pace. Not there's obviously you know times where it doesn't happen. It's usually because there's something going wrong, but this usually dictates the pace up here. This the the um, once the signal is generated at the SA node, it travels down to the AV node here. Um, that AV node allows for a delay, right? The whole point of the heart is to get that synchronous contraction to get blood flowing, right? So the top of the heart will contract, right? Right up here, it'll contract. And as it goes down through the, the valves, it'll start filling up the ventricle. And as that ventricle fills up, uh, there, there comes a point where, that, where the AV node doesn't delay it, uh, where, the, where the delay stops and the, that, um, that signal travels down the uh, the bundle of his, which are basically like these giant cable-like structures in in the heart tissue itself, and it allows for faster conduction um, down the heart. Um, and so the signal is propagated down, and then gets dispersed through these Purkinje fibers, which really just are like tentacles that go all throughout the heart muscle. So that way, the signal from the AV node just shoots all throughout the heart pretty much at one time to allow for that really strong squeeze, right? Because if you think about it, if the heart muscle itself was more asynchronous, right? If you had signals generating at different areas in the heart, instead of getting that good squeeze, like one part of the heart will, will um, squeeze, then another, then another, and it starts to just quiver instead of actually uh, pumping. And so that's why something like uh, ventricular uh, fibrillation, where all the signals are generating not so much in that bundle itself, but all throughout the heart, that's dangerous because you don't have that synchronous squeeze that allows for that blood to move forward, right? So this corresponds with our EKG because the the SA node, when that when that signal is generated and propagates down the top of the heart, down the atria, that corresponds with the P wave, right? That's that first bump that you see in the EKG. And then you see this delay uh, from, from the P wave to the QRS complex right here. This little delay allows for blood to flow down, down into the, the ventricles, right? So as the ventricles are feeling, filling, you need that delay to make sure you get adequate amount of blood to make that pump worthwhile. And so you always see this really big peak over here for the QRS complex. And that is just all that really thick heart tissue at the bottom of the heart in the ventricles squeezing those those those, uh, those signals depolar depolarizing um, pretty much in unison uh, to really get that good squeeze. And that's why we have such a high deflection. There's a lot of electrical activity that happens at that time, right? And then you have this delay to really get that squeeze in. And as this heart starts to relax and the re the uh, and starts to repolarize back to the original relaxed state. Um, this T wave, uh, you'll see this T wave, and that just really corresponds to the heart going back to the, to the relaxed state where it can then get ready to fire once again. So um, that's in a nutshell how your heart uh, contracts and how it correlates to the EKG. So what are the different leads? So basically a lead is a sticker that you place on the body. So there's three that you, uh, uh, that you place on the body that forms a little triangle. So uh, one is on the, the right side, one is on the left side, one is on the ankle itself. And you look at the different signals on those leads to help uh, generate a picture of the heart. And um, if whether, I don't know if all of you have taken calculus yet, um, but this is all vectors, right? And in physics as well. Um, vectors is a, a vector is a number with the direction, right? So if we're looking at lead one, 
that's looking right here at the at the right shoulder. You place the lead right here and you look and you basically take a picture of the heart looking from that left shoulder. Right. What is a signal looking like coming from um, coming towards that left shoulder? Um, same thing with lead two, same thing with lead three, where that arrow tip is. That's kind of where you're looking at the heart from. So if we look at uh, we will kind of go back and forth between the two pictures. If we look at lead one right here, we're looking at it from the left side. We're going to see this big spike right here corresponds uh, to that QRS, right? So if the heart is kind of in this position in the chest and the signal comes from here down, it's more left dominant, right? You're, you're, the signal is going from right to left and it's traveling in that same direction as lead two, as lead one, right? So lead one is looking at it from the left. The signals are traveling uh, from right to left. And because of that, we'll have a positive deflection up here um, on, on lead one. So this shows us that the heart signal is propagating the right way. Versus if we look at some of the augmented leads, these are kind of just leads that we, we do some math to look at the heart from a different angle. Uh, if you look at ABR, ABR is looking at the heart from the, uh, from the left side over here to the right side. So this is opposite the way that the heart actually conducts and the heart actually uh, triggers and squeezes and the electrical signal propagates, right? Because the, uh, the signal in the heart itself propagates up here from the, uh, from the right side down to the left side over here. So in this general motion, right? And so if it's going this way and AVR is looking at it going that way, then we know that um, our signal should actually be opposite. It should be negative. So and then we'll see that here where the AVR peak actually dips down instead of going up. It's it's a lot of information, uh, but if, if you look at each of the leads and the way they point, uh, it, it's more helpful and it'll help you actually understand how each of these leads corresponds to a specific territory of the heart, right? So because if we go back to this, this EKG, we see that the changes that we're worried about this, um, if you look at, let's say V1, for instance, V1 looks more or less okay, where you have that big deflection up and it comes down. Um, the, the T wave is, is a little uh, different, but um, we know that this right here, where the wave, the QRS complex comes down to pretty much the baseline, um, that's more or less normal. But if we look at V2 and V3, it comes up and it doesn't go down all the way to the baseline and there's a secondary hump there. And that's your ST segment elevation, right? The ST segment, like we talked about here, this segment right here doesn't come all the way down to the baseline. Instead, it comes like halfway and then forms this other little hump there, right? Um, just like we see it here. So that tells us that this is a STEMI, right? There's something very wrong going on with the heart. Um, and so knowing the territory of the heart tells us where exactly the STEMI might be. And so if we look at this one right here, uh, we see the, the ST segment elevation happening in V2, V3, V4, V5, uh, not so much V6. So if we go to the precordial leads, which are basically stickers uh, throughout the chest, we see V1 is right here to the right of the sternum, V2 is to the right to the left, and then you continue all the way throughout the chest to kind of get a 3D picture around the heart. So her issue is happening from... Um, from V2 all the way to V5. So we know that territory is from here all the way to V5. That's kind of looking at that left side of the heart. Um, if we go all the way back up to this first picture um, right here, and this is kind of like where if the heart is sitting um, in the chest wall, this is kind of right here, V1, V2, and then going around the heart, that's gonna be your left ventricle. So she's having a uh, a heart attack basically of the left ventricle. Okay, so that's why knowing these territories, understanding the way that the waves are deflecting, being able to know what is normal, what's not normal, and that's probably the most important part of all this. That's super important. And I know this is a very, very, very rushed um, uh, overview of um, 
of EKGs, and we'll go in depth more with this, and I'll put a video out to make sure that you guys uh, can practice with this a bit more as well. So, um, any questions about that at all? That, I know that was super, super, super quick. Donya, do you have a question, or is it or is your hand just raised? Sorry, that was an accident. Oh, no worries. OK, so then what is your assessment and plan of this patient? What do you think is going on with her? And anybody can answer it. Ashleen, what do you think is going on? All right, Danya, what do you think is going on? Well, the ST segment elevation suggests mm -hmm. an active heart attack. So start um, treating her for that right away. Yeah, so she's having a heart attack right now. You want to treat her right away. What are you going to do? Um, cardiac catheter. Yes, got to send her to the cath lab, right? So uh, you got to send her to the cath lab. Time is heart um, tissue. So um, the longer it takes, the higher risk she has of uh, cardiac cell death. The more heart cells die, the higher risk she has of actual death or things like heart failure. So you need to get her in as soon as you can, okay? Um, so then when you, when you write up your treatment and plan, your, your assessment and plan, you write your assessment. So a 65 year old female with a history of hypertension, diabetes, presenting with chest pain for the last two hours, um, uh, vital show, um, tachycardia, hypertension, um, uh, tachypnea exam, um, you, you don't necessarily have to put the exam in there um, because it's not as relevant necessarily. It, once you get the, you can say EKG shows ST segment elevations in V2 through V5, and then troponin was elevated, uh, most likely secondary to a myocardial infarction. If you want to be more specific, you can say of the left ventricle, um, and then your treatment is going to be catheterization, test, you eventually would maybe want to get a, a, an echocardiogram. You, you potentially want to do, um, if you were concerned at all for a, a DVT or a PE, you might want to consider that as well. Um, and then what your follow-up is and, and your plan going forward. I think there was one question that I had asked. I don't know if we actually got to it. Um, and that was, what other lab would you have wanted? Um, and the one that I would have asked for is a, um, I, I would want to get a BMP uh, because that's going to include a creatinine. The creatinine is going to be very important because you're injecting dye into this patient, right? The dye can be uh, with the catheterization. The dye can actually be very harmful to the kidneys, uh, especially if you already have injured kidneys. So. Um, it's going to be super important that um, you you check the kidneys before you do that. Okay. Questions about this case at all? No. Okay. So submit the the um, submit the the class the the course whenever you get the chance. It's just the questions that we kind of went over today. Um, now we're gonna switch gears super quick because we're a bit short on time to um, to the cahoots. Um, that way we can we we can do it real quick and then get you guys going for the day. Okay. Um, as we do that, um, if there's any questions, just please shout them out. All right, so let's start. And I'll put the code up real quick. All right, that's the pin. I'm going to give it like three or four minutes. Go ahead and, and join in, OK?
just make sure um, you're using the same name, right? Because we're we're going to be tracking, right? So it might be easier to do first name, last name. Um, that way we can know um, as the weeks go by what the actual score is. And again, top five is going to contribute points to your actual team. Um, once we get the team sorted, um, we we will kind of start putting a leaderboard on uh, the scholarly site, and then your own personal score will be recorded as well. The person with the highest score at the end of this program is going to be uh, is going to get a a Litman uh, stethoscope. So, give it about another minute. I will be right back. All right, so it looks like it looks like we're actually losing people. Um, let me see. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. All of the questions are going to be for points. Okay. All right. First question. Who said you could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me? And I appreciate that. And if you guys read my email last week, you, uh, you would have seen it. Okay. The first two questions are not really medically related. They are worth points. So, and hint, it's the person in this picture that's not Dave Chappelle. Jay Z, exactly. So, um, I forget the name of the song now. It, it's in a song, uh, it's a very famous song. Even if you don't know the name, you've probably heard it before. And the theme for today is music. So last week was all animals. This week we're going to go with music. Uh, all right, let's see who's on the leaderboard. Ashleen, okay, first place. All right, let's go to the next one. This one again is more for fun, but it's also worth points, okay? Uh, Quest Love is the drummer of which band? They now play, and the hint is they play for the Jimmy Fallon show. There's going to be, every time we do this, there's going to be random questions like this, which is going to all be based off of chance. So uh, next week's theme is probably going to be TV shows, not exactly sure. The Roots. Good job. Um, how many, I'm wondering, how many of you knew of The Roots before, um, before um, they played with Jimmy Fallon? And just put it in the chat um, on, on YouTube, or if anybody wants to, uh, I think somebody raised their hand on, on in the course. Yeah, whoever raised your hand, just go ahead and, and shout out. Okay. All right, next then. 
So Nima is number one now. Cool, cool. All right, let's go. Uh, elevation of the troponin corresponds to which of the following? Aortic dissection, costochondritis, end STEMI, or pneumonia? And while you guys answer, uh, I'd be very surprised if any of you knew who this artist was. Uh, is. His name is Gali. He is an Italian rapper uh, from Tunisia. Um, so just heads up, if anybody wants to hear great Italian music and you like rap, uh, look up Gali. He's really good. Uh, so NSTEMI is correct. So an NSTEMI, uh, like we talked about in the, in the cardiac um, videos, corresponds to ischemia of the heart itself without full, uh, without full um, clogging of the actual artery. So you, what ends up happening is you get not enough blood flow to, to, the, um, to the heart cells because you have that, that uh, stenosis of the heart, but you're still able to get a little bit. So the thickness, the, the part of the muscle that is dying and becoming more ischemic is not the full thickness of the heart itself, but only a portion. So you will have damage to the heart cells, so you will have elevated troponin for that. So it looks like 28 of you got that right. Uh, aortic dissection and pneumonia, you could potentially have a troponin increase, but not all the time. All right. So Ashleen, number one, followed by Shavi. Good job. All right. Next question. If a patient hospitalized for a pulmonary embolism, which of the following would help determine the etiology of the patient's embolism? So large extremity ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound, chest x-ray, cardiac catheterization. And uh, I'm sure, I hope a lot of you know who this artist is. Uh, if not, her name is Amy Whitehouse, uh, probably one of the most iconic singers uh, ever. And her music is really interesting because she has a lot of jazz inspiration. Um, and she is able to make it more poppy. So um, if you've never listened to her music, which you should listen to her music, it, she has a really beautiful voice and the music itself is very interesting. So yes, for this question, lower extremity ultrasound is, uh, is what would be indicated to help it see if, she, if the patient had a DVT that, um, that uh, was thrown off and went into the lungs themselves. So um, the second most answered question or the um, second highest answer is the chest x-ray. And that's incorrect unless you have, if you're suspecting there's an infarct of the lung, you can potentially see that. But for the most part, a chest x-ray for pulmonary, emb pulmonary embolism is usually normal. You would, you would want to maybe check one, make sure nothing else is going on, but it's not going to help you determine what's actually, ca what actually causing embolism or where it's coming from. Um, you'd want to make sure that you examine the leg. And if you have a high enough suspicion, you get that ultrasound. Okay. So no change. All right. No change on the top. So which of the following is an appropriate treatment for costochondritis? So IV fluids, heart catheterization, metoprolol, ibuprofen. And that is a surge. I can't, I can't, I can't pronounce his last name. Um, he is the singer of System of a Down. His vocals are amazing, right? He has, he has a really good range. And the, the, if you've never heard System of a Down, um, it, they're an amazing band and they're very political um, with what they sing. Um, and their music's awesome. So uh, ibuprofen is correct. Most of you got that right. Metoprolol, you would want to use for a... Um, if you're, if somebody had a heart attack to really slow down that con conduction of the heart, allow for more, uh, more of a, a, a squeeze or more time to fill up the ventricle and squeeze more blood forward. And it also reduces stress on the heart. Um, but this is more of a long-term medication, uh, that also affects the blood pressure heart cath. You wouldn't want to do because costochondritis does not have anything to do with the actual heart muscle itself. And IV fluids isn't usually indicated in car uh, costochondritis. Um, unless you see the patient is dehydrated, but that's usually not because of the costochondritis. All right, so Shadi's number one. Okay, uh, two, more, two more questions, two more questions. Which of the following EKG findings are more consistent with pericarditis? ST segment elevations and leads to pre avf sinus bradycardia, diffuse ST segment elevation, or normal sinus sweep. Uh, 
this artist right here, his name is Carlos Vivas. He is uh, a very famous Colombian singer. He, uh, his type of music that he usually sings and plays is called Vallenato. It's, ve it's very... Uh, it's very synonymous with Colombian music. Um, and if you guys watched the new movie Encanto, he actually um, played that song. I forget the name right now. It's like Colombia, Colombia Me Encanta or something like that. Um, so listen to his music. It's actually really, really good. So EKG findings for pericarditis, uh, it's diffuse ST segment elevations, right? So the entire heart is inflamed because of that pericardium that's inflamed. So you have those signal changes. It's not specific to one specific territory, which is what you would see if you had a blockage of an artery that's affecting one specific part of the heart, such as in the ST segment elevations and leads two, three, and ADF. Uh, sinus pericardia, normal sinus rhythm, you wouldn't usually find with uh, pericarditis. All right. Okay, so a fight for third place is going on right now. Okay. Um, the QRS complex and the EKG corresponds to what part of the cardiac cycle? So atrial contraction, atrial relaxation, ventricular contraction, or ventricular relaxation. And this artist, his name is Strome. He is um, from France. Um, he has a few very famous songs that have crossed over here into the U.S. Um, and if you, like, Alors Dons or something, I think that's what is probably his most famous one, but his music is actually, his voice is really, really good, first of all, and the music behind it is really good. Even uh, his style is a bit more, uh, more synthetic versus more like natural instruments, but still phenomenal. All right, so uh, ventricular contraction, exactly. That huge depolarization of the ventricle that uh, leads to the contraction of the heart is that big spike in the QRS complex. Atrial contraction is going to happen um, as in the P wave when that first uh, part of the, the signal goes and it pushes the blood down to the to the bottom. The atrial relaxation doesn't really have a, uh, a signal per se. Um, you'll see more of, of that um, as the in the in the PR interval, uh, and then the ventricular relaxation happens more in the T wave. All right, so. Okay, okay, Shadi is keeping it strong. All right, last question. Which of the following is not part of Virchow's trial? So stasis, infection, endothelial injury, or hypercoagulability. And this is not an artist. I just put the, the painting here um, in celebration of the first uh, part that has been transplanted. So, uh, yeah, that is good. So infection, exactly. So the other one, uh, the other three are part of Virchow's triad. All right, so let's see who won. So third place is Ashley, good job. Second place, and good job. And first place, it's, it's Shadi, probably. Yep, all right. So congratulations, guys. We will go ahead, uh, we will go ahead and put uh, the scores down and we'll keep, start tracking everybody's uh, everybody's points. Uh, and then I think uh, fourth and fifth places are going to show up down here too. Um, remember the first five, uh, place one through five is going to be the ones that are going to contribute to the team score. Your own personal score is going to accumulate throughout the sessions, okay? If there's any questions, we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. Okay. All right. So I that I know we went a little bit over. I am done as of now. Um, if you have any questions, I'll stick around to answer any questions you have. Um, and anybody on YouTube, um, if you would like to come and talk to me as well, um, you can go ahead and. Uh, you can go ahead and send me uh, a message or um, on Instagram and I can try to add you in or we can figure out another time as well. So thank you guys for sticking around. I appreciate it. Thank you.